substance use disorder or addiction, as it's is still called, is you can think of it as a dysregulation of the brain chemistry. It's induced by repeated exposure to drugs. When I say drugs, I mean all drugs, tobacco, alcohol, caffeine, even, if you will, not just illicit substances. I know as prosecutors, your role naturally focuses on illicit substances, but all drugs work the same way in the brain as far as changing the function of the chemistry of the brain and sometimes even changing the anatomy of the brain in, in micro, micro anatomy of the brain. There are definitely um, people who are more likely to suffer from substance use disorder. Substance use by choice early in adolescence increases your risk of developing substance use disorder, for one thing. Psychiatric illness, including depression and anxiety, uh, increase your risk. Trauma or adverse childhood experiences increase your risk of going from being a choice to use substances to, to a substance use disorder. About 50% of the risk is genetic. So if you have a parent with substance use disorder or another first, what we call first degree relative, which would be a parent or a sibling uh, with substance use disorder, then, then you're at much higher risk. So if your parent was an alcoholic, for example, um, your risk is not just for alcoholism. Your risk is for any substance use disorder. People ask a lot of times if, if, addiction or substance use disorders a choice. And drug use may be a choice. We may choose to have alcohol on Friday night. When a person has substance use disorder, it's not a choice. You know, the first use may have been a choice, but as substance use disorder develops, you no longer have a choice. You have a compulsion to use. Treatment's never really done. Even people with long-term recovery um, have to work on maintaining their recovery. Return to use is considered to be an expected part of recovery. So that's very counterintuitive because return to use sounds like not recovery, right? not getting better, not staying away from drugs. It's not flipping a switch. It's more like climbing climbing a mountain. And you're going to slip down every so often. And the idea is to make sure that person gets back on the trail and resumes climbing. So punishing a return to use is kind of going to push them further down the mountain. It's more like adding an avalanche to the climb. Most substances have a, a physiologic withdrawal um, where at the very least the brain chemistry is resetting itself. Some drugs like alcohol and opioids affect the whole body. So there's this physical withdrawal that in, affects the entire nervous system, the digestive system, the heart, everything. People will go through this when they stop consuming the substance. Alcohol withdrawal can be fatal. Opioid withdrawal is not usually fatal if the person is hydrated and otherwise healthy. Benzodiazepine withdrawal actually is the other one that can be potentially fatal if it's not recognized and managed with medication. So the mortality related to return to substance use, particularly with opioids, but also with benzos and sometimes with alcohol, is very, very high. And it can take as little as three days. So even just for opioids in particular, you could be detained, arrested and detained and just waiting for your hearing and you're in jail for 72 hours. And you come out and your tolerance, you're a raw nerve, you're still in acute withdrawal, but your tolerance is gone. And so that person comes out, they have their hearing, they walk out the street, they get their drug because they haven't learned anything new about how to deal with the world and their substance use disorder hasn't been treated. So they, they use what they used to use and they die.
there are different types of medication for the treatment of opioid use disorder. There's actually three specific medications. We have methadone, which is what we call a full agonist, meaning the more you take, the more effect you get. The agonist, the ones that act similar to the drug. So if you think about opioids, they relieve pain, um, they cause sedation, and then they cause respiratory depression and death. So a full agonist, the more you take, the more effect you get right up until it kills you. Okay. Partial agonist is one where it it does all of those early things, pain relief, maybe sedation. Of course, it relieves withdrawal if you have it. But there's a point after which more medication does not cause more effect. So it only acts like the drug partially. There's a ceiling on the effect that it can have. And so that's buprenorphine. And this gives it a... a a better safety profile and it makes it easier for the prescriber to use and regulate. So it has some advantages over methadone that way. Now, the other category is the antagonist. A lot of um, people in criminal justice or law enforcement have a hard time getting kind of their heads around the idea that you're going to give an opiate to somebody who has opioid use disorder. And so they're much more comfortable with the idea of a blocker, an antagonist. The only drug in that category right now is naltrexone. Naltrexone comes in an oral form and an injectable form. So the injectable form works for about 30 days. And the way it works is you have to be completely off of opioids and often you have to be off the opioids for about seven days before you can receive it. Because if you get it too early, it can cause an extreme form of precipitated withdrawal that can require hospitalization sometimes. In the community, this is often too high a threshold um, because to get detoxed off your opioids or withdraw from your opioid and then stay opioid free for as much as a week in order to go and get the shot to be the antagonist is 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 often it's just people don't make it and once they get on it the main thing that it does for them is it blocks other opioids and then 28 to 30 days later they have to go get it again and in in the community we don't find that people usually get more than one or two shots and we know that uh substance use disorder is chronic condition and that people don't get better in 60 days. Um, they need a lot longer than that. So the antagonists are appealing, but they're, uh, in terms of supporting recovery long-term, they may be somewhat limited. You need to think about how you would expect any other medical condition to be managed. If you have high blood pressure, you're going to want your healthcare provider to give you the treatment that's got, going to give you the best chance of controlling your blood pressure so you don't have a heart attack or a stroke, right? That's the decision making that you want your healthcare provider to make. And that type of thinking is what needs to be applied to the choice of medication for people with opioid use disorder as well. We all need to remember that it is an illness and the choice of medication is a medical decision and should not be one that's based on policy or the opinion of a, of a non-health professional. If I needed medical care, I would really not want to go to a, a place that says our policy is that everybody gets this drug for your condition and whether it's right for you or going to work for you is not factored into the decision. I think it's important to make sure that policies and practices that are in place regarding the use of medication to treat a medical illness rise to the standard of healthcare decision-making and aren't driven by opinions or um, fears, concerns that some stakeholders might have about or preferences a stakeholder might have about what drug is better than another.